this morning uh, and, and next week as well. We'll take a, a brief seasonal departure from our uh, regular sermon series in the book of Romans. And this Palm Sunday, we come to uh, the text that has been chosen, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I ask that you would please listen now as I read, for this is the very word of God. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves." And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, He repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you. We pray that by the power of your word and spirit, you would give us eyes to see what it is that we truly need. And we would be able to reject our sinful wants that do not correspond with our true spiritual needs. And you would help us to see that everything we truly need In Jesus we find. Bless us now, we pray, to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. So happy Palm Sunday. As most of you know, Palm Sunday is the day when the church has historically celebrated Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem. It kicks off what we commonly refer to as uh, Jesus' Passion Week or Easter week, or in some circles, Holy Week. As such, I'm sure the details of Palm Sunday are familiar to many of you this morning. Perhaps you can even see them in your mind's eye, right? Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, while the crowds wave palm branches and herald him with shouts and loud cries, heralding the coming king, oh, the blessed one who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, if you've spent any time in church in your life, this is surely a familiar scene to you. 
And yet, if you are familiar with this scene, then you are surely familiar with the events that transpire in the week to come after this scene. And you know then that for all of its familiarity, the events of Palm Sunday are at the same time rather complex. For as we shall see over the course of our Easter week worship, and as anyone can see if they continue to read to the end of the gospel accounts, what you will know is that in less than one week, the same crowds that heralded Jesus as the coming king of Israel were calling for, even demanding, his crucifixion. Now, it's a pretty dramatic turn, to say the least, right? It causes one to ask, what happened in those days? What transpired to bring about such a dramatic turn of, of emotion and desire from the crowds? Well, as we said earlier, the, the answer to that question is rather complex. On one level, we could speak about the power and the sovereignty of God, how it was all according to God's plan and purpose that there would be a radical transformation in the crowd's opinions and desires about Jesus. And, and this was God's doing so that according to God's plan, the Father would send Jesus to the cross in order that Jesus might die, in order that the Father might raise him from the dead, in order that God might provide for us everything we need for eternal salvation. On one level, we could say it was all God's doing, and we would be right. And yet, at another level, at the level of human action and responsibility, we can also say that part of the reason why this dramatic turn of emotion and desire took place is that in the end, the crowds realized Jesus was not the king that they wanted. He did not fit the bill, their bill, and so they rejected him. And of course, this rejection was no fault of Jesus. No, as we'll see, he was precisely the king that they needed, but he was most definitely not the king that they wanted. What did they want? Well, we know from the scriptures they, they wanted a king that would be a, a great political ruler, a king who would display all the signs of earthly power and glory, all the, the signs of pomp and circumstance. They wanted a king who would immediately defeat the Romans, restore Israel to a place of earthly grandeur, and resurrect their wounded national pride. They wanted a king of political...
anointed leaders at particular times and dates. Well, that had not been easy. It had not been easy because Israel had not been good. The book of the Judges ends with these ominous words. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And this was true not only of the people in general, but we also see here from uh, 1 Samuel 8 that it was true for the leaders as well. That even the great prophet Samuel, the faithful prophet, had sons who did not walk in God's ways. But they turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So what we see here in verses 1 through 9 is that the elders of Israel, knowing all of this history, they've, they've gathered together and they've come to Samuel and they make what I think we can call is an unfaithful request. And we see this request spelled out in verse 5. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now at one level, if you know some of the the messed up history of Israel in recent days, you would say, well, this request seems to be decent and in order. After all, the land was in a state of moral anarchy. The prospective leaders for the next generation, Samuel's sons, were morally and spiritually bankrupt. The people openly recognize all of this in verse 5. And surely they know that in the previous decades, Israel had been in repeated wars They had been regularly overcome, even enslaved to other nations. And and at this point, they're politically and militarily and economically vulnerable. They're a people in obvious need. So we might conclude that this request for a king, it makes perfect sense. It seems altogether reasonable. We might even say it sounds wise. And yet the text makes it very clear that the request is altogether unfaithful. We read that the request displeased Samuel, and it drove him to prayer. And in prayer, the Lord spoke to Samuel and confirmed the legitimacy of Samuel's grief. For the Lord declares that in making this request, Israel has rejected the Lord. They have rejected the Lord from being king over them. Despite all that the Lord has done for Israel, Israel had consistently forsaken the Lord and served other gods. And this, the Lord says, is what they're doing right now, right here in 1 Samuel 8. Rather than seeing their desperate plight and returning to the Lord in repentance and faith and new obedience, they declare, well, the problem's not us. The problem's not our sin and our rebellion. No, the problem is obviously God. He's not able to give us what we want. He's not worthy. No, we need a new leader. We need a king, just like all the other nations. And oh, how tragic. Oh, how unfaithful this request is. Because it strikes at the very heart of the reason for Israel's existence as a people. You see, God declared in his word that he had chosen Israel and created Israel and delivered Israel out of bondage and brought them into the promised land so that they could be his treasured possession on all the earth. He he wanted to be able to dwell with them and give them his law so that they would be a holy and distinct people from all the other nations of the earth. And in doing this, they, they would then have the opportunity to be a holy and distinct witness to the nations of the earth. And yet what we see here is now Israel has formally rejected God. They've rejected his rule. They've rejected his holiness. And instead, they now desire a king who will make them what? Just like all the other nations of the earth. They want what nations want. They want great earthly power. They want earthly rule. They want earthly prosperity. The kingdom they want is not the kingdom God has destined them for in his word. And it's certainly not the kingdom they need. And yet, they want what they want. And we see then in verses 7 and 9 that despite how tragic all of this is, God is willing to grant their unfaithful request. 
He is willing to give them the kingdom they want. And yet before he does this, he gives the people a faithful warning in response to their unfaithful request. We see this warning in verses 10 through 18, right? Samuel essentially warns the people, brothers, be careful what you wish for because you will get it. A king like the nations is not all that it seems. All that glitters is not gold. Know this, Samuel warns, the king you want, he will take your sons for his military purposes. He will take your daughters for his aesthetic purposes and comforts. He will take your lands and the fruit of your lands for his wealth. He will take your servants and a portion of your livestock to be his own. And in the end, you will be his slaves. I think you could summarize this warning with one little phrase, he will take. We see that in verse 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Seems like a theme. And as a result of all this taking, Samuel says, you will then cry out, because of the king you have chosen for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Samuel warns, be careful. Please reconsider your request. For I tell you, the kingdom that you want is not the kingdom that you need. But as we see in verses 19 and 20, Samuel's warning does not make the people reconsider but it actually hardens their position so that their unfaithful request in verse 5 becomes an unfaithful demand. They respond to Samuel in verse 19, No, there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Their determination is clear. They do not want a kingdom of divine holiness, a kingdom set apart by repentance and faith in the Lord and pursuit of new obedience in accordance with his word. No, they want a kingdom of worldly power and success, just like all the other nations. But I'm sure they presume we'd actually like to turn out a little better than all of them, right? We want to be just like the nations, but better. And so we see here in verses 21 and 22, God grants their request. He gives them the kingdom that they want. And we see their desires on full display in the opening of chapter 9 when they choose Saul to be their first king. Why do they choose Saul? Text is very clear. Because he's wealthy, verse 1. Because he's handsome, verse 2. And because he's physically bigger than all the other men. It's obvious they want a kingdom of earthly power, earthly wealth, and earthly beauty. And given those desires, Saul is perfect. And God gives them what they want. And of course, if you know the rest of the story, Saul ends up being a disaster of a king. He is rich and good looking and big but he is disobedient to the Lord. You might say, like people, like king. And he ends up leading his people and his family and himself into ruin and death. Now, at this point, you might expect the Lord to just wash his hands of the whole kingdom matter, that he would abandon this kingdom concept and let the kingdom of Israel fall into tyranny and collapse in keeping with his prophetic warnings, so that he might say, I told you so, the kingdom was a bad idea. And yet, God then does something very surprising. Even though the existence of the kingdom of Israel has come about because they have rejected God, God chooses to use the kingdom of Israel to establish his purposes, his rule, and his reign in the world through this kingdom. He lets the people pick their first king, Saul, but he then intervenes to choose their next king. 
And he picks a king who has none of the outward qualities of Saul, right? He picks a king who's the youngest and smallest of his brothers. A king that even Samuel questions at first, but God tells him, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And in David, God chooses a man, a king after his own heart. This young man ends up delivering the people of God from all their foes. And yet he does this not through the traditional means of human power, but through reliance on the supernatural power of God. As David defeats Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, he declares, I do this that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. So in David, there is a throne that is established in faith and righteousness. Israel gets a glimpse of the kingdom they need in the form of the kingdom they wanted. But God then goes one step further. Not only does he bless David's kingdom in the short term, but in 2 Samuel 7, he promises David that he, that is God, will establish the rule and throne of one of David's sons in such a way that he will rule forever. The kingdom that Israel needs, God will provide, and it will be even greater than than what they wanted. God will do exceedingly more than all that Israel could ask or imagine. So that, once again, even though the kingdom of Israel came into existence because Israel had rejected God, God declares He will turn that very kingdom into the kingdom of His eternal rule through His own appointed king who will come from David's line. What we see then in the coming chapters, as as we studied uh, quite extensively in 1st and 2nd Kings, right, is that there is a real tension then in the scriptures between the promise of an eternal righteous king that Israel needs and the fulfillment of, of God's original warning to Israel about the tyranny and oppression that will come as a result of the king they want. We see that David himself falls into sin. And despite the strength and the prosperity and the success of his son Solomon, the people feel the oppressive weight of Solomon's rule. When they appeal to Solomon's son Rehoboam to be released from all of Solomon's royal taking, Rehoboam pledges that he will take even more. And again, as we saw in First and Second Kings, the kingdom of Israel then divides and degrades. And even though God occasionally gives the people a good king from the line of David to remind them of his promises, overall, we have to conclude the kingdom of Israel is a disaster because the people continually reject God and they chase after worldly success. They continue to act just like all the other nations instead of pursuing holiness unto the Lord. They engage in all the practices of the nations. They esteem the values of the nations. And they worship the gods of the nations until in the end they are conquered by those same nations. And the kingdom of Israel is brought to almost nothing. The kingdom Israel wanted was not the kingdom that they needed. And as a result, they ended up with neither. Well, what did they need? They needed needed to be ruled by God. They needed God to save them. And not only save them from external foes and economic woes, they needed God to save them from their selves, from their own sin and rebellion, from their own hearts that wanted all the wrong things and rejected the things that they truly needed. This creates a great dilemma as the Old Testament comes to an end, right? We wonder, will will Israel, for that matter, can anyone 
ever get what they truly need if it's never what we truly want. And this brings us back then to Palm Sunday. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Because you see, in the person of Jesus, God has done a most remarkable thing. God has not only anointed a man to be king, God has become a man to be king. God has taken on a human form, a human nature, a true and complete humanity. And in this human being, in the human being Jesus of Nazareth, God has sent his perfect king into the world. The fulfillment of all the promises he made to David. Jesus was heralded as the great Davidic king in his birth, heralded by angelic choirs. He was worshipped as this king in his infancy by the wise men. And throughout his life, he lived as the king in perfect righteousness and holiness to the Lord. And yet, his kingly life was one that was filled with tension, one that was filled with a seeming contradiction. Because on the one hand, he had no outward form or appearance that people would esteem him. He was poor. He was from the backwater town of Nazareth. He had none of the accoutrements of royal power or prestige or accomplishment. And yet at the same time, he preached with an authority no one had ever seen. He performed miracles and signs that brought awe and wonder. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He fed the multitudes with just a few loaves and fish. He raised the dead. And his works and his words provoked many to say, I think this is the king that we want. This is the king that we've always wanted. We read in John chapter 6 that in response to his miracles, many wanted to come and make Jesus king by force. Because you see, many saw in Jesus a long-awaited tool to fulfill their greatest desires. He He would bring them power and prestige and wealth. He would give them vengeance against their old foes. This was what they wanted. This is what they had always wanted. And Jesus actually seemed to have the miraculous power that could pull it off. So some laid hold of an Old Testament promise here and there, and they gladly declared, this is the son of David. This is the king who will give us what we want. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, there were many glad to declare, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, because in this man God is finally ready to give me what I want. And yet, what they discovered is that what Jesus came to do is give us what we ultimately need. He came as God's own divine son to bring God's rule, God's kingdom to our very hearts. He came not just to save us from external foes and economic woes, although in the end he will do that, but he came to save us first and foremost from ourselves. He came to save us from our sin from our own rebellious hearts, our own dreadful desires, which seek our own glory and always lead to death and judgment. He came to bring us a salvation that is far greater than anything we could ask for or imagine. I mean, most of us, right? We'd be content with our guy winning an election and a bull market. But he came to bring a salvation of eternal glory and joy and peace. He came to save us from all of our sin and all the ways we're sinned against. And he came to make us holy, holy to the Lord, holy in the Lord, holy with the Lord forever. And yet, the way 
he did that was not through the might of armies or political conquest, but it was through the cross. For he came to bear the weight of our sin. He came to suffer in his own body the penalty that our sin deserved. He came to be our king. He came to rule us and subdue us and defend us from all our enemies. But he came to do it by dying on a cross. There on the cross, Jesus felt the full weight and punishment for our sin so that he could set us free from the penalty and the power and the ultimate presence of our sin. And of course, Jesus didn't just die for us. He rose from the grave. He arose. And in his resurrection, he won the ultimate and eternal victory over all the power of sin and hell. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus now saves all who believe in him. He saves us from all our sin, all the ways we've been sinned against, and he saves us to be with him for all eternity. In Jesus, God does a most remarkable thing, going all the way back to 1 Samuel 8. He saves the people who rejected him. He saves the people who said over and over, give us what we want. We want a king instead of God. But in Jesus, God says, I will give you a king, a king who is God, and he will give you what you truly need. And he will save you from the inside out so that in the end, by the work of my grace, the kingdom you want will be the kingdom you need. And the kingdom you need will be the kingdom that you want. In the end, God brings his people to want Jesus. And so therein lies the challenge, the question for each and every one of us this morning. There is a a question, a choice that stands before each one of us today. Is the kingdom you want the kingdom that you need? Is the kingdom that you need actually what you want? You might say, well, we're 21st century folk. The question is irrelevant. Most of us have matured beyond monarchy. But make no mistake, in our nature, we still want all the things that are embodied in a kingdom. We want earthly power, prestige, recognition, wealth. We want vengeance against all our foes. We want public victory and vindication. We want to have our national and personal pride exalted. And we look around. We look to many things that can give us the kingdom that we want. We look to politics, economics, wealth and possessions. We look to national military strength, personal achievement and prestige. We look around and by nature we ask, who can give me what I want? As a result, every election seems to bear the full weight of our hopes and dreams and fears. The world can become a source of our worship. And in all these longings, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, they can seem like quaint recollections and seasonal sentiment. We're prepared to sing, attend special services. We get decked out for East, in Easter finery, but then we're tempted to go right back to yearning for what we want most, power, prestige, wealth, public victory, and vindication against our foes. But Jesus comes to us today, and he says to us, I've, I've come to give you what you need, salvation from sin eternal communion with God, heavenly joys and everlasting peace of body, mind, and soul. I've come to make you holy as I am holy. 
And know this, I have won, I have secured this kingdom through my cross and resurrection. And now I'm calling you to follow me, to pick up your own cross and follow me. Follow me in weakness. Follow me in humility. Follow me, more than likely, in in suffering and persecution. Know this, my kingdom is not of this world. It doesn't play by the world's rules and expectations. It doesn't beat the world at its own game. No, I'm a radically different sort of king. A holy king. A divine king. Fear not, I will save you to the uttermost, but you have to trust me, believe in me. And then come and follow me to this glorious end. Now don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. It's not wrong to desire effective politics. It's not wrong to long for a stable economy or a strong national defense. It's not wrong for Christians to labor to these end with our vocational callings. But know this, these things which can, in fact, be faithful servants of God, they make very poor gods themselves. They will disappoint you again and again in this life, and they cannot save you. And when you come to die, they will be of no use to your soul. They will not be able to rescue you from the kingdom of darkness and the internal imprisonment of your soul in sin. Only Jesus can do that. Only his life and his death and his resurrection can save sinners like you and me. And he truly does save. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I tell you, his kingdom is what each and every one of us truly need. And my simple prayer this Palm Sunday is that God's spirit will be at work in us. So that we will see the glory of God in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We will see the power of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we will look to Christ and we will desire His glory. The glory that comes from God and we will love that glory far more than the glory that comes from man. And we will seek first His kingdom and His righteousness by faith in Jesus, so that we could truly sing the words of Martin Luther's great hymn, that we could sing, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Oh, brothers and sisters, may the kingdom we need be the kingdom we want. And may it be the kingdom that we pursue with earnest desire through faith in the crucified and resurrected King of Kings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so prone as people to chase after the stuff of this life. We want what we want. We want you to go get it for us. And if you don't, then we'll look for someone else. That's what Israel did in the Old Testament. It's what happened on Palm Sunday. It's what people do by nature. But we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to save us. So that we see with spiritual clarity what it is that we really need. That we see that the world can never meet the needs that we have. Only you can do that. And we pray that by the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, we would look to him as the king we need. And by the power of your spirit, he would be the king that we long for. We pray you would bless us in Christ even now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.